We're not going to reach our target of becoming self-sufficient this year. Unfortunately, the weather has been absolutely awful and it's taken a toll on some of our crops. It's also had quite an interesting effect on our bees as well and we'll be showing you something about that in a moment. However, I'm pleased to say that our hens are doing rather well and throughout August they've been laying lots of eggs for us but also laying them in some rather interesting places. Nevertheless, we're fighting on to make sure that at some point in the near future we do manage to grow all our own food in suburbia. So, welcome to Self Sufficient in Suburbia for August. It's now the start of August. Now this isn't normal bee swarming season. Nevertheless, one of our hives has swarmed today and I have managed to capture it. Now, it's swarmed because basically the seasons, the weather is all out of kilter. This year we've had a very dry and mild winter, which was in part warmer than the wet and cold spring that we had. And we're now into summer, allegedly, so it is a little bit better. But the bees have swarmed in response to the rather odd weather conditions. We're not the only people who are experiencing autumn swarms, uh, sorry, August swarms. We've had other uh, beekeepers reporting similar as well. Nevertheless, we have captured the swarm and instead of using the usual bucket and box or box method with the sheet on the ground, we've used a new bit of kit to capture it. Well, this is the bee box that we've bought and the lid comes off and instead of shaking the swarm into a cardboard box or a bucket and then overturning it on a sheet on the ground, we simply shake the whole swarm into uh, the box and then put the lid on. Now I say whole swarm, there'll be plenty that uh, don't uh, get into the box and it, on the side of it is a small hole and we'll see if we can just zoom in on that but it's a hole that's big enough to be able to let the bees in. There it is. And there's some gauze on the outside as well to allow for ventilation but basically what happens is that if the queen is in the box the other bees will follow her in and it looks very much as though that's happened because most of the bees have now that, that were not captured straight into the box have now gone into it and then later on today we'll tape up that hole and take it down to our other apiary and put it into a new hive. We'll find out later how we got on setting up the new hive. Now since we set out to become self-sufficient one of the things that we learned is that waste not, want not is much more than just a catchphrase. Radishes are a very easy vegetable to grow. Plant the seeds and within six weeks to two months you've got a, a crop and uh, here's some of them that I've just picked. Lovely good roots on them. Now most people think of radishes as simply being a vegetable that you can use in salads but actually it's quite versatile. You can actually cook the roots, cook the radishes themselves but you can also use the leaves as well and back in the kitchen what we're going to do is show you how to use these leaves to make a soup. My first job to do back in the kitchen is to chop one large onion, add it to the pan and lightly cook it until it's tender. Whilst you're waiting for the onions to cook, chop up the leaves of the radishes like that, a nice large bowlful. Uh, if the plants are old and woody then don't bother using them because they'll be indigestible. But young plants you can use the leaves and the stalks as well. 
Once the onions are lightly browned, you then need to add the leaves and stalks. And then a couple of chopped potatoes. And then you need to add a vegetable stock. dried herbs and a couple of bay leaves, uh, two three bay leaves and then some a couple of crushed cloves of garlic. Then bring that back up to the boil which will take just a couple of minutes. You can use chicken stock if you want, uh, we're using vegetable stock, uh, but you'll need two litres well, this has now come up to the boil, so we're going to turn the heat down and let it simmer for about 25 minutes. We'll just give it a quick test. Hmm, yeah, that's not bad. All we need to do now is remove the bay leaves and uh, blend it. something that you'd normally have thrown onto the compost heap or fed to the chickens. So, this is me sorted for dinner tonight. Hens don't always do everything that you want them to do in the right places. Now this is one of our hen houses and uh, nest box at the end and the hens hardly ever lay in the nest box. They, what they tend to do is lay in the main part of the hen house. So I've got a couple of uh, eggs laid today. But uh, sometimes if you allow them to go free range they don't always lay in the hen house either. Well once you've let your hens out and effectively they're free range in your garden or allotment then you will sometimes find that they will lay somewhere hidden in the garden or under shrubbery and this is one corner of our allotment and in there, hidden away is the latest laying area that I've found in the last couple of days well, it's on this compost heap here where we found that they've started to lay. So if you find that your egg yields have gone down, do a search around the allotment or garden in the most hidden places and you may well find some eggs where they shouldn't be. Here in the corner of my dad's allotment, uh, he's planted mint. This is some of it here. Now the problem with mint is that it's very invasive. It can take over, and indeed it has done down here in the corner of the garden. Uh, and it can crowd out other plants, so we're going to have a bit of a problem digging a lot of that mint out. Nevertheless, it's a very good mint crop. So what we're going to do is take back some of this mint and use it in the kitchen to make some mint sauce. Hmm. Well the first job to do back in the kitchen is to strip the leaves from the stalks and finally chop them. Whilst you're chopping it, I often find it's useful to really crush it as well, help bring the flavour of the 
mint out. But as I say, keep crushing it as you go along and add it to the large mixing bowl. That's the, the leaves all now chopped. The recipe I'm using is one that my dad taught me years and years ago. And what he used to do was chop some spring onions and some scallions and add them to the mint as well. Now once you've got to this stage you then need to add some sugar to the mixing bowl and basically you're not looking for enough to be able to mix through the whole of your leaves so that the leaves are fully coated with sugar. And you're then going to leave that standing for about an hour or so and what will happen is that the sugar will help to draw out the mint taste. Well this has now been standing for an hour and if we give it a quick stir we see that the sugar is quite damp underneath. Uh, basically it's been drawing out the liquid in the leaves and what we're going to do now is cover the leaves with white wine vinegar. a stir and what we're going to do is add in a little bit of sugar to taste so it's up to you how much sugar you want if you like it really tart then obviously less sugar well I'm just going to test a little bit of this to see if it's sweet enough. Now I would say that needs a little bit more sugar before we put it into jars. Here's one of the jars I've just made. Now the best thing to do is leave it standing for at least a week before you use it and in that time it will allow the mint flavour to seep through into the vinegar. Well something else to watch out for when you let your hens out around the garden or allotment to go free range uh, and that is they will find the place they want to have as a dust bath and all my hens now use this bed here which is where we grow our artichokes and uh, they do end up getting quite deep down into the ground so just beware that that's one of the things that can cause damage on your crops and in your vegetable beds. Well time to find out how we got on setting up the new hive. It's now about four hours since I first put the bees into the box and what we're going to do is tape up the hole at the front, uh, at the end of it there, uh, some duct tape. I've put a bit of duct tape on the uh, that side as well just to make sure that no bees get uh, stuck to it on the other side of the hole and we just carefully put that over and I'm going to use some duct tape to tape down the lid as well because there are awful lot of bees in there and it feels quite heavy uh, and we're going to shift these in the car down to our other apiary. Uh, the roof of the box. So gonna...
See if any shape the others are from not bother yet. Yeah, we'll, we'll get that done now. Uh... Right. Brush them away from this edge. Mm. Just stop you in the, um, in the yes, box. Yes, well, that's all right. Just brush them away from the edge. Get the back of it and get that super over here to here. <laughs> right, are you ready? Yeah. Ready? Right, go. So there we go, that's the new hive now set up with the swarm uh, brought here in our very own bee box. One thing hens love to do is to scratch around looking for worms and bugs and slugs and snails and so on. Now that's great exercise for them and it's a really good food source as well. And you can see here that some of mine are digging through a few shovel, few, uh, shovel loads of manure that we've just recently put onto one of the beds but not properly spread yet. Now the problem is that if you let them out around the allotment like we do or around the garden they can cause an awful lot of damage to your crops and they will dig up lots of plants which you really don't want them to do. It's a very simple solution to keeping the hens off uh, vegetable pot plots is simply to put a low uh, fence like this around it. This is just a bit of wire netting and in there is our beetroot crop which fortunately they haven't managed to dig up yet but uh, given the time I'm sure they have done so if they were able to get access to it. Now this is our polytunnel uh, which we've opened up but unfortunately before we opened it up a couple of days ago the hens did get in and do some damage to the leaks that were in there uh, so what we've done is we've just surrounded it with this wire netting which is now doing a good job of keeping them out but as I say watch out if you're going to let your hens out they will cause damage, so there's areas you need to fence off to stop them getting into. This is the bucket of wild raspberries I picked this morning. It's a much better wild crop than we were expecting given the weather. So we've got enough to make our normal jam and we're going to use some of the extra ones that we picked to make raspberry vinegar. Into a bowl put a kilo of raspberries and then use a wooden spoon to crush them to get the juices out of them. Well, once you've got to a nice wet pulp like that you then need to add 600 millilitres of white wine or cider vinegar and then give it a quick stir and you're going to leave this standing 
for a couple of days. Just put a clean tea towel over it. The raspberries have now been steeping for about two to three days in the vinegar, that's them there. So these are now ready to be strained through a jelly bag or piece of muslin. You may find that when you're straining it, to make sure you get every last drop out of it, give the bag a bit of a squeeze. But once it's finished straining, measure it out and put it into a pan. As the vinegar is heating up, add 700 grams of sugar for every litre of liquid. You see that the vinegar is now coming up to the bar, but it's also formed this uh, sort of slightly scummy lie, uh, and the best way to deal with that is just to spoon it off like this. But once it's up to the bar, you need to keep it on that bar for about five minutes. It's now been boiling for about five minutes. I've managed to spoon off most of the scum layer. So we're going to turn the heat off now and leave it to cool, ready for bottling. This is one of the three and a half bottles of raspberry vinegar that we've made. Beautiful red colour to it. And this is the half bottle. So I'm going to have a go at uh, just sampling a little bit of this without spilling it. Oh, 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 that's beautiful. Oh, fantastic. Well, that's going to be great as a salad dressing or it can go into sauces. Now, one final point about making raspberry vinegar is that you'll be left with some uh, raspberry pulp with uh, vinegar already in. Don't throw it away. It can be used to make a raspberry chutney. You need to add a few more raspberries into it and a bit more vinegar and onions, but it'll be great for using to make a preserve in that way. We keep bees because we want to produce honey as an alternative to using commercially produced sugar. Now, many of you may know that bees have been in decline in this country, as indeed a lot of pollinators have. For the past 50 years or so, bees have lost an awful lot of their foraging areas. Most of the wildflower meadows that Britain used to have 50, 60 years ago have now disappeared. But there are various things you can do in your own garden to help pollinators, to help the bees. And one of the most simple ones is that if you have a privet hedge, let it grow through the summer and let it flower. Because what we've discovered on the hedgerows around the allotments here is that they're not cut to the, the standard and to the degree that garden hedges are. So the privet flowers and the bees love them. It's got lots of nectar that attracts the bees during August when the privet is flowering. So save yourself a job in the summer, let your privet hedge grow and let the bees have some foraging areas to go to. Maybe you cut your hedge in September after the privet has finished flowering, but do all you can to help the bees and other pollinators in your own garden. Well, that's it for August from Self Sufficient in Suburbia. Join us in the next edition when we'll be looking at some of our wild food foraging and how the weather has affected it. See you then.